Hello, my name is Roger Manti, and it's my great pleasure to moderate today's panel, Only the Lonely, Promoting Health and Well-Being Through Community Music. I'll dive in and, and uh, offer up that to suggest loneliness has become a major issue is an understatement. Both the BBC and the Harvard Business Review have referred to, quote, the loneliness epidemic. Uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation has called loneliness, quote, a major public health risk. And in January 2018, then British Prime Minister Theresa May went so far as to appoint the world's first ever Minister for Loneliness. And all this, of course, before the advent of COVID-19 and forced social isolation. We do tend to think of older adults when we think of loneliness and social isolation, but loneliness is not restricted to older adults. The UK's Office of National Statistics found that students reported feeling more lonely than pensioners. And a 2016 study of the of Canadian university students found more than 66% of them uh, reported feeling very lonely. Beyond older adults and students, there are many other vulnerable populations, such as those with multiple sclerosis, for example, or those diagnosed with dementia. Suffice it to say that loneliness affects everyone from time to time. This might not be a problem, except that loneliness is so strongly associated with many chronic diseases and factors of ill being. I realize we are preaching to the choir here in a Community Music Activity Commission, but uh, just to remind us that research has shown that social participation in activities such as music not only protects against such things as morbidity and mortality, but contributes to well-being in multiple ways. There's even a recent movement in the UK, for example, in parts of Canada called social prescribing. Today, we'll hear from four practitioners who have engaged in community music work that intersects with, interacts with, and generally relates to issues of loneliness and social isolation. I welcome to our online stage, Sasha Judelson, Glenn Murray, Lori Sadowski, and Jared Young. Sasha, can we begin with you? Hi, hi to everybody out there in that virtual world. I'm a community musician practitioner in two different sessions, settings. Firstly, building a musical foundation for the very young and young children. And secondly, with an intergenerational choir. And both those projects are actively research-based. What I'm interested in finding out is who gets left behind and left out in performance-oriented thinking and supporting social change through connections in informal group music making. I'm a graduate from the Masters in Community Music at Wilfrid Laurier University and the project I'm talking about today I created as part of my master's degree. So we all know that one of the principles of community music, a sense of belonging, provides the opportunity to address loneliness. So make that loneliness which is recognised or otherwise as the loneliness of the participants. In the community music project, the circle of music, communitas is at its core and is closely allied with a sense of purpose. The circle of music is an intergenerational choir for people living with dementia, their partners in care and volunteer students. And each of these core groups can experience loneliness in varying ways. Alone or lonely can be experienced even though you might be with others or another. And living with dementia means that the landscape is in a pretty constantly changing state. And that applies to both the person living with dementia and their caregiver. The students are of an age where much is changing for them. And the navigation for each of these core participants can be lonely. The Circle of Music aims to address these aspects of loneliness by underscoring true intergenerality. Bainan and Hayden at all in 2013 wrote a lot about that intergenerationality, supporting, belonging and mentoring. And for the circle of music, the key is the continuity of the pairings and the sense of unity that is created. As referenced by Bailey and Davidson in 2005, Cohen in 2009 and Faulkner and Davidson in 2006. So students are connected to a senior couple and those groupings remain constant. The mentoring, supporting and connecting, which as a result flows between seniors and students, increases self-esteem and provides an opportunity to rethink what may be originally perceived as a problem and decreases negative perceptions. And the atmosphere at sessions is informal. 
though actually there's nothing casual about what we're doing. In fact, it's all carefully planned and prepared. And these consistent relationships alleviate loneliness, as does the circle formation we sit in. The seating plan, names are on seats, and the social time before and after, to name but a few. And the music is a vehicle to push that alleviation to the next stage, be it from singing familiar songs, which removes pressure, to being non-performance oriented. The focus is on engagement, not accuracy, highlighting benefits and connection to stimulate social change. By addressing the roots of loneliness from not feeling part of a community or doubting one's own purpose, there follows consideration of a longer term solution to the highlighted issue of loneliness. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Saja. Uh, Glenn, if we can get you to, uh, yeah, put your video and your audio on, let's uh, turn it over to you. Hello, my name is uh, Glenn Murray, and I'm a graduate of the Wilfrid Laurier Community Music Master of Arts program in 2017. I'm a songwriter, music educator, and a social justice advocate who has worked with vulnerable communities for over 20 years, including orphan children in Southern Africa and indigenous youth on flying reserves in the far north. In the fall of 2019, the Scarborough Arts Council partnered with the University of Toronto Scarborough campus to bring an interactive music project to three different retirement homes in our area. Scarborough Retirement Home, Retirement Suites by the Lake, and McCowan Retirement Home. The project was led by myself and two university graduate students, George Zepp and Luck Wilson Alina, utilizing a choral music practice with an emphasis on social relationships. Students from the university's music program were brought in to assist us with the goal of alleviating feelings of loneliness and isolation between the two demographics. One of the most important aspects of the project was the socialization before, during, and after the program. It's here where we discovered and learned so much more about our participants and developed lasting relationships with them in all three homes. We prepared by consulting with each home to choose songs that would be familiar and easy for the residents to follow and created songbooks to bring to each home with large fonts and adaptability for different vocal abilities was inherent in our approach. After our first session, we changed our approach from all three of us singing at the front to one where a facilitator led the music on the piano a second supported on guitar moving through the room, and the third also worked the room, encouraging participation and singing right beside the residents. Once we arrived at this formula, the visits grew in attendance, response, and overall enthusiasm. We also brought in 30 djembe drums to conduct a drum circle in all three homes. The energy and response to the drumming was enigmatic and joyful. The residents literally grew taller in their seats, their faces radiating pure joy, and their physicality reflecting the impact of the drumming on their emotional well-being. Evidence of the importance of relationship building occurred when one of the participants asked us at the end of the session if we liked them. At first we thought she was joking but quickly ascertained that she was very serious and intent. We replied wholeheartedly that not only did we like them but that we were very fond of them and that our visit with them was the highlight of our week. She smiled and told us we like you all very much and we look forward to music day. Relationships are what, really, what, are what really matters. Her comment enca encapsulated what community music is essentially about, building and developing genuine, meaningful, and lasting relationships that are created around and through the music, not because of it. We can never underestimate the capacity of a person's ability and level of comprehension based on their age. We learned so much about their personal stories and made lasting friendships. The sharing of music, humanity, compassion, and our stories are the foundation of community music, and the music is merely the conduit and bridge between us all. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, Lori, if we can get you to uh, activate your camera and your audio. Hello, um, my name is Lori. I, I wear multiple hats. Like Sasha and Glenn, I'm a graduate of the uh, Wilfrid Laurier University Community Music Master's program, which I completed in 2016. I'm also the Arts and Medicine Coordinator at Niagara Health System in Niagara, Ontario, Canada, a program uh, and department that I developed where I create social arts-based programming for people affected by cancer, as well as I research its impact. I also do th research through Wilfrid Laurier University in the field of community music, and I avidly seek arts and research grants in the community to create social uh, music-based and multidisciplinary arts programs for people in various capacities. 
One of my primary interests is working with people affected by multiple sclerosis. Uh, Canada has one of the highest rates of MS in uh, the world and in the Niagara region where I live, uh, it has one of the highest rates in Canada. Three people in my family have MS, one of who I'm a carer for, uh, so it plays a significant role in my personal and now professional life. Uh, research shows that um, those with multiple sclerosis who participate in the arts experience a more satisfying quality of life and social participation improves quality of life for people with all disabilities linking to self-esteem, life satisfaction and mental health and addressing isolation. Isolation and loneliness play a significant role in any chronic disease primarily due to the involuntary effect of limitations proposed by the illness. My most recent work included a research study to develop an arts-based engagement strategy for people affected by MS and piloting a songwriting course to assess how community music project can influence the quality of life, build a sense of community, and improve overall wellness through active participation. The results of the study significantly underscored the importance of being socially engaged. For all participants, this was as simple as getting out of the house uh, and being able to interact with people. Someone said they're no longer locked up with all of their disabilities. There's value in using a community music lens to this type of social programming and using a professional musician in this type of capacity with community music based facilitation skills was a key element to our success. We also integrated the use of a sound beam, an assistive musical device where participants' physical disabilities did not limit them to musicking. We effectively engage participants in a collaborative, inclusive experience. Skill development and therapy were not priorities, and we led the participants to discover the musical journey for themselves, highlighting the whole time that they are co-creators in the process. We ended up having a public performance, which was very exciting for all participants and very well attended in the community. Uh, this project ultimately allowed participants to become more active in their external community through fostering relationships and being exposed to new places and opportunities. Their experiences demonstrate the quality of life for people affected by MS can be enhanced through a form of community music-based participation. If you'd like to know more about the project and the results the and the next steps we envision for it, as well as our innovative use of the sound beam, you can attend my session on July 7th titled The Seeds of Our Songs, The Experience of Songwriting for People Affected by MS. Thanks so much, Laurie. Uh, that's fabulous. Uh, we'll be sure to check that out. And uh, Gerard, uh, maybe we can uh, get you active on the audio and video. Turn it over to you. Hi, thanks a lot, Roger. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with um, this wonderful panel. My name is Gerard Yun, and I'm actually uh, California-born Chinese-American and Jamaican-Chinese on my mother's side. I immigrated to Canada 14 years ago, and I'm now located in Waterloo, Ontario, uh, living on uh, the land originally inhabited by uh, First Nations Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee and one, the people once referred to as neutrals. And I'm now a community musician a professor of community music at Wolfrid Laurier University and a practitioner and teacher of the contemplative arts. I um, trained in Western music as a conductor, I somehow earned a doctoral degree in choral orchestral conducting years ago and practice, that was my main practice for years. I'm also trained through direct transmission in several cultural forms, including the Japanese Zen Buddhist Shakuhachi, the meditation flute, which informs much of my contemplative practice, which I'll be talking about today. I run a weekly live and now online, as you can see up there, contemplative music pause, as well as overseeing an inter uh, campus and community music meditation group, which has been running now for six years um, out of the university campus. We're in a time of considerable physical and societal isolation, not just social, but fabrics being torn apart and a time of great misunderstanding, not only of the world around us, as in climate and socially, our neighbors, our communities, and the people who seem to inhabit uh, different generations from us as well. I think I'm talking a little bit about my own teenagers and within our own families. Loneliness um, is not about the absence, just the absence of others. And uh, Dr. Amelia Worsley writes, modern loneliness isn't about being physically removed from other people. Instead, it's an emotional state of feeling apart from others without necessarily being so. And I would add to that, the disconnection to others coexists with our sense of separateness or disconnection from ourselves. So that's what my work is about. Through contemplative practice, the connection and reconnection to oneself and one's world can be accomplished through regular practice and enhanced, I should say. 
and I choose to transmit compassion practices such as mindful self-compassion, Ton Glen and Lo Jong, some of which are kind of esoteric, but can be taught. These are designed to awaken empathy and compassion through the gateway of self-compassion. That is, we connect through others by first connecting uh, authentically with ourselves. And it's my intention to support and assist others in my programs, my research, and my practice in easing suffering caused by physical, social, and cultural isolation through the sharing of contemplative practices and the sense of well-being, belonging, and connectedness and reconnectedness that they can bring. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Gerard, that's great. And maybe if we can get all of you uh, activating your, your video now and your audio, uh, we can maybe ask a few questions of all of you. Uh, and uh, Sasha, maybe, maybe we can begin with you. Um, uh, you, as I understand it, you continued your activities after COVID-19 restrictions were put in place. And I'm just wondering if you, uh, if you can speak to, to, to that experience and, and, and what that was like and what we might take away from that. Yes, um, ob very obviously, since we have seniors in the project, they're part of a vulnerable community and meeting was not practical in any way, shape or form. Um, but I stayed in contact with uh, people through email and phone calls and it was quite clear that people were missing that connection that we had each Thursday. So uh, what we're doing at the moment is we have the pianist recording the accompanying line for the songs um, and then we'll have the students sing over the top of that and then I will facilitate the seniors who are excited, but also in slight trepidation, you have the technology piece, which they don't feel competent to tackle. But I think what I'm more concerned about is that the polish that's come to be expected by those sort of multiple face videos will mean that some of the connection disappears. And to hopefully alleviate some of that, we're gonna meet each week and catch up and talk about how people are finding the experience, difficulties, enjoyment. Um, so we'll, I will be collecting data, we'll see how the pivot works. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, Gerard, if we can turn to you next, uh, the, the pandemic has arguably, uh, I might, argue at least, uh, brought to light a, a real global awareness of loneliness and social isolation, uh, you know, probably like never before in, in uh, recent history, at least. Um, I'm just wondering, can you speak a little about the, maybe the apparent paradox between mindfulness, this sort of individualist practice, you know, in one sense, and this notion of community? Um, absolutely. So what most people don't know is the version of mindfulness that has come down to us in North America actually started during the Vietnam War and came out of a tradition of, of Zen Buddhism in Vietnam, um, in Asia. And it was because um, meditation has often been seen as sort of navel gazing, just sort of you know, like, what are you doing? And the being detached from the world. Even in my flute tradition, in my flute playing tradition, they traditionally wear these things called ten guys, which are essentially baskets to over their heads to symbolize that they're detached from the world. Those were also tricky things when the, yeah, when they when ninja were infiltrating and became secret assassins. But the um, but the engaged Buddhism that I'm talking about that came to us as mindfulness was started by a bunch of monks who said, you know, we're going to get out there and we're going to help people. And we're going to do this during this war torn time. This is the version of Buddhism that came to North America during the 70s and then was grown up or grown out the practices with various teachers that either were exiled or or um, immigrated here and then was changed into a secular version um, that we call mindfulness. So I take the roots of that, always being careful to bring that forward. And the engagement comes from combining self-compassion, the stuff you're working with, that sense of disconnecting it with um, a sense of common humanity that in fact, we are all, sh we share the loneliness, we share isolation, and then we share also are able to share the solutions of that. It is a regrounding 
And also some of these things that I do regularly practice wise are in fact um, communal practices. We get together, we hold space and we either meditate or sing together and experiment with that. I have a workshop on that at the next CMA. Oh, um, great. Session. Okay. Yeah. Definitely uh, check that out. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Maybe we can change gears a little bit. Um, uh, Glenn, uh, your project, uh, which I do know a little bit more uh, about directly, uh, but it was actually put on hold in January prior to, uh, to the COVID restrictions uh, because the retirement residences actually went into quarantine related to just a typical seasonal flu outbreak. Um, I'm just wondering if, uh, if you can just speak a little bit uh, about your experience working with older adults, especially, you know, in your presentation, you talked about relationship building and whatnot. Um, can you, can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, one thing with um, the home being closed down in, in January, when we were all set to go, um, myself and the facilitators were really disappointed and not just because we could see immediately the impact of, of what this was doing for the residents, and it was anecdotal. One of the uh, directors from one of the homes told us there was a woman in particular who was openly uh, quite, I would say, uh, a bit of a curmudgeon, shall we say, when we first arrived there and criticizing our, our keys that we were singing and, and questioning a lot of the things we were doing and snapping at some of the other residents. And the picture that you see with the, the woman wearing the wild Halloween glasses, well, that's her after a few months of the program. So there, there was an enormous change in the way that she was interacting, not just with us, but with everyone. But um, I think the, the story that resonated most with me was after our second session, one of the gentlemen uh, asked if he could speak with me and he explained that he had Parkinson's disease and that it affected his throat. And he told me that after these, these sessions of singing and he said, listen to me, he goes, I couldn't speak like this before. Because this is so healing for me, this singing. And then the couple, like before our Christmas break, he spoke to me again. And he said, this has made such a difference in how I feel and how I'm able to communicate. And the first time he said that to me, we both had tears in our eyes. And, and to me, that's what this program was all about, was, was you, you remove the layers of what we think people living in a, in a retirement home are, and you learn their stories. And then you discover that what this like simple interaction that you do once a week is not so simple. It's complex and life changing. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's, that's very powerful. Um, maybe I'll follow up uh, with you and everybody else in a moment uh, on something, you know, you raised up, well, many amazing points, but uh, one in particular that we'll follow up with, but maybe we'll give Lori a chance first. And I'm just wondering, um, your work relates, let's just say loosely speaking, uh, with issues of immobility. And I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit to, you know, loneliness, immobility, and how that might uh, factor in. Uh, you know, it, it, COVID has, has brought uh, a sort of a new lens to that, but of course, uh, MS predates COVID-19. So I'm just wondering if you can speak to, to immobility and, and loneliness. Sure. Um, definitely having multiple sclerosis uh, can be different for a lot of people. There's different kinds of MS. Um, some are more debilitating than others. Um, most people in our group had or, or have, sorry, progressive MS, which is a type of MS where you basically have progressive disease and, and things um, continually get worse. So we had a lot of walkers crammed in there and uh, a few wheelchairs. Um, I think what was really nice about this project and, and stuff like this is it gives people a chance to get out. Uh, but what we heard a lot of feedback was people really like, and I've done other projects in the past with people with MS and with people um, without MS, but with other issues, uh, that when you're in a room with other people who just understand without having to um, talk about it all the time, it makes things a lot easier to be able to communicate with one another and to be able to feel comfortable in the room. So, uh, you know, they didn't have to um, explain to people why their hands wouldn't work, for example. Some people couldn't play 
easily easy small percussion instruments because they couldn't quite easily grasp them and that doesn't have to go with an explanation i think that makes it a lot easier um, getting out of the house can also be a struggle for people because they need a carer to bring them there and that needs to be an accessible location so we made sure that we took out every barrier possible to participation so we had a fully accessible location we used our local ms society which included a fully accessible washroom which is very important for people with ms um, the other part being that we, um, people were not required to do anything. They could just sit and participate and write lyrics if they wanted, um, but we coerced everyone to sing and then they eventually did, even though they didn't want to at the beginning always. Um, the other side being we used a very innovative instrument called uh, the sound beam where participants could just wave their hand over the beam to create music and they loved this. It was very integral to our, to our project and I'll be talking more about that in my presentation. Uh, we definitely, um, getting out of the house for people was very important because it could really increase their confidence. It was very meaningful and validating to them. They felt um, that they achieved things that they normally couldn't do. And something like this is normally not offered for people uh, who are affected by a disease and are pretty much homebound, which most of them said that before this and other than this, that they are homebound. They, they have no other things to do. Right. Um, quickly, I was gonna say the last thing is we are thinking of doing a Zoom version of this uh, to continue our project. We're not sure how that will look, but we're we're hoping that we can um, do something. So we've reached the idea, and it's becoming uh, very well received so far. Fabulous. Well, listen, we've got about three or four minutes left, and not to put you under time pressure, but you know, Glenn gave that example of, of Parkinson's, and I'm just wondering if each of you, uh, you know, the, the person with Parkinson's, and I'm just wondering one of the challenges in community music work, community music therapy work, all of this kind of work that we do is having to demonstrate or prove impact or, or whatnot. And I'm just wondering if, if in like 30 seconds or, or less, each of you can just offer your thoughts on the, the kind of challenges you faced in trying to demonstrate impact or an example of that, or the, the, you know, trying to show to other people the meaningfulness of your work. So Sasha, uh, 30 seconds, go. I think one of the difficulties for me is that so much of it is anecdotal. Um, we have ethics approval on much of our research, but most of what comes out is just in brief conversations. But I will um, echo exactly what Laurie said. It's very meaningful for the seniors to be in a place where other people are in exactly the same situation and they don't feel they have to explain. And I think for the students, it sort of takes them out of themselves and they're at an age when they are impressionable, but also want to make a big impact. And so seeing them connecting with other people who are not in the same situation as them um, is very rich. And I will just end by saying what, what uh, beautifully for me, one of the um, caregivers talking about coming to the circle of music and what it meant to her and her husband she just said it makes me feel less lonely fabulous okay glenn 30 seconds unmute yeah it's 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 a similar situation that we have where it's qualitative data and how do you, how do people who want numbers and statistics to measure impact take our data and, and, and discover the validity of what we're doing uh, beyond anecdotal stories. So what, what we were doing is, is after every program, we would have a discussion with, with each group and we had a, a series of questions that were, were the same for each, each session so that we were able to cross-reference cross growth as we went through the program. And then we just had our observations under that. But we started to, I started to become really avid about uh, taking photos and videos and collecting a whole huge library of, of videos. So being able to date those videos and, and see the, you could see a measurable increase in growth. And then, and in particular, one of the things that I think that may not be brought into seniors homes is drumming because there's an associated physical limitation to that, that, that I was guilty of that stereotype myself. And that program in its own was the most impactful out of everything that we did. And literally like that trans physical transformation and radiant beaming faces was real evidence that that type of program 
does make a difference in how people. So we maybe just have to tell some better stories, perhaps. Um, it, you know, like, it, because, you know what I mean? Like, and I mean that in a very serious way, but we need to tell better stories because if people only saw what you saw, I think that might, um, that might help uh, go a long way. Lori, we are running out of time. I don't want to put you on the spot, but uh, let's, let's hear from you. I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, our project was a research study, so we had planned our data collection beforehand. We had pre and post questionnaires, field notes, um, we recorded video for each session, and we had a final performance and a guest book. So we had a lot of data to take from. Um, obviously, we had a lot of positive results. The people said, like I said, they built confidence. It was meaningful, validating. They felt very proud of what they did. We heard that pretty commonly as well. Um, and this ended up being a paper and a research study. Study as well. So qualitative data I know isn't uh, as great as numbers, but I think it's becoming more and more accepted as, as valuable uh, research, uh, especially for something like this where we want to collect people's stories and we want to collect um, what people feel directly. So yes. we have a lot of that data from my study. Fantastic. And Gerard, not to put you under any time pressure, but uh, <laughs> we, we, you deserve a chance to speak too. So the direct experience and the stories thing is really important. I won't go back through that. However, um, as I said, the one of the programs I work with has been going for six years and the, and it's basically student run. And so they just keep coming and then uh, continuing to have these strong practices. And then um, of course they need it. We do have work to do with bringing that experiential knowledge together with curated knowledge and then distributing it to show that this is something significant. Fabulous. Well, we look forward to hopefully many great questions and interactions in the discussion to follow. So thank you to all of you. I appreciate your contributions and uh, we'll, uh, we'll leave it there. Thanks.